Episode 4, The Bat in the Ermine Cape, Side B. So, a heartbreak curse. Do you think it's because of that weird fungus stuck on its face? We're right up to the taper now. Its shoulders up to my chest. The arsonist pets the weird mammal, tries feeding it some of her gum. The taper is not impressed. I don't give any thought to what I'm about to do at all. The words just come out of my mouth. Lorraine is Shoal. I say it. I say her name. Banana mush drools through opaque fangs as a stereoscopic image echolocates in the bat's auditory cortex. The ermine cape rustles, and the bat lifts its head, screeching with the sound of malfunctioning sonar equipment. (laughs) (laughs) And... There's a ripping in my chest. Like walking hand in hand with a lover on a magnificent spring day through an open field. Only for a waterfall to tear itself from the sky and flush your partner out and away into a gaping sinkhole. Did it work? The taper wails in confusion and backs up. The apricot it was eating shakes on its own, the orange flesh bulging and rippled, small hands peeling the skin back from the inside. A naked girl emerges from the fruit voraciously eating a strange, earless rabbit. She stares at me. Feral. Blood plastered across her neck and chest. White fur, torn and gouged, held to her mouth. She screams into the rabbit's chest cavity, in unison with the bat in the ermine cape. And then she winks out of existence with a clap of static. I take the arsonist's hand in mine and hold it to my chest. Absolutely. It absolutely works. We return to the bar and watch the bat eat more banana. The taper lumbers slow in search of more fruit. The arsonist swaps her whiskey for a beer, grabs me another. We sip quietly for a while. She's considering speaking a name to the bat in the ermine cape. I can tell. 
It's just too easy to do. See, Lorraine was my girlfriend for three years. She was creative, sweet, much smarter than me. We lived together for a year in a professor's basement while she finished her graduate degree. I did freelance work from home to scrape by, but I wasn't kidding anyone. I was pretty much unemployed. And I was depressed, with a hard D, in a windowless office all the time. She needed space. I was suffocating her. It was a hard decision on her part, I think, because it took her a while to make up her mind. But she called off our relationship in the end. Totally understandable. I didn't even argue with her, just packed up my stuff and left. Lorraine certainly doesn't deserve to be alone forever, or be cursed with my feelings about our relationship. But I spoke her name anyway. I'm not sure why. What I am sure of is that the naked girl that came out of the apricot was her. But why was she eating a rabbit? This is something that may end up haunting me, because Lorraine has a phobia of them. Rabbits, white ones in particular. What kind of monster Lorraine has become now because of me, I'll never know. All I know is that I can feel myself towing the rim of that sinkhole in the beautiful spring day meadow. How it feels to stare down into its depths in awe that I didn't reach out my hand to try and save her. Not a single fucking inch. I gesture for the arsonist to continue her story. <clears throat> So I wasn't allowed to go on the hike to Rainbow Falls at camp because I dunked a girl's head in the toilet. I thought it was fair, though, since she tricked me into drinking out of a water bottle that someone pissed in. For how much your childhood seems to have sucked, she's rather playful. Anyway, most of the camp went on the hike and there weren't many counselors around. Just like two or three making out, dry humping behind the mess hall. So I hung out with the horses in the stable. Whoever was in charge of them didn't know what they were doing. The horses' hooves were overgrown. They had clear saddle sores and patchy hair from rain rot. Manure overflowing from the stalls. It was a barn for equine atrocity. The only thing that was nice to me in that camp was a horse in there. Poco. An old, tired quarter horse. Totally brown. Nothing people would fawn over or take selfies with. Just like me, I guess. I knew how to ride from a few lessons back home. So I knew you weren't supposed to leave a saddle or a halter on the horse in their stall. But the counselors hadn't taken that stuff off Poco that day. You know, them being too busy getting it on. So, I decided that me and Poco would have an adventure. We'd both free ourselves and find out who we really were, together. The arsonist spins on the bar stool, bow-legged, spanking an imaginary horse butt. I mounted Poco and she could tell that something big was about to happen. We busted out of the barn. She slid in the mud and I bent over, held onto her mane. <laughs> the counselors fell over with their pants around their knees and we were gone into the woods. I knew no one would catch up to us. The pine forest was damp, all stained black with moss spreading around the trunks. It smelled like somewhere neither of us were supposed to be. But we were there. We were there and we were never going back. I rode Poco off the path, cut across the side of the waterfall trail. It took too long to take the kids up there, so the counselors were leading the camp to the base of the waterfall. Rainbow Falls plummeted off a clean rock bluff about 30 feet into a dark pool. 
By the time Poco and I got to the top, the sun was angled just right, casting rainbow bands through the waterfall mist. I tossed the saddle off Poco, stared down at the whole damn camp circled around the bottom of the falls. The arsonist is standing on the bar at this point, pointing hard and with purpose, like I imagined she did back then. She takes a final pull from her beer and throws it deep into the garden. And then I jumped. Poco bolted, and I heard her race across the stream off into the woods, free forever. And I fell through a rainbow, through bands of light and mist with my mouth wide fucking open. And I swallowed that rainbow. I made it a part of me, stealing away one of God's miracles. And for some reason, that's the only time I've ever felt like who I really should be. Just in that one moment between the top of the waterfall and sinking into the pool below. I know what it feels like to be that person, but I still don't know what kind of person that is. She looks at me, nodding, sad, but not afraid. I know what you can do, what you can really do. So, if the time comes, I want you to go inside my thoughts, like you do, and I want you to find this memory of the waterfall, the horse. And I want you to watch me in that rainbow gulping it down. I want you to see what kind of person I really am. You can be the only one who knows. Now run. What the Constellations rain upon the garden dirt in sharp shards of triangle and lie. A tremendous black coffin noses through the opening, and around this coffin are astronauts. Pure white, descending from open void, clacking porcelain armor as they land, their gloved hands overflowing with flowers. The arsonist melts a hole through one of the astronauts, igniting their back-mounted oxygen reclaimer. The casket floats in midair, and an eye appears, conical and swiveled. Then the coffin shimmers with crystal lattice, becomes the crowned head of a lizard queen. Uh, pull your sword out, you fucking moron. I strafe away from the jet black chameleon, its eye zooming back and forth between me and the arsonist with scaled clicks. Her nose is crested with mace-studded butterfly wings of split rhinoceros horn, the royal nasal triumph of a Kaluma Parsoni chameleon. One astronaut is on all fours, in a pose of primal predation. Its helmet visor is eating the flamingo, biting on its neck. Pink feathers swirled from the bird's panicked flapping. Another astronaut approaches me, light from a phosphorus grenade strobing from its helmet, flashing wild and white hot with caustic silver smoke. I slashed between the fingers of its glove, all the way down to its elbow. A beam of light shoots out from the severed arm flap, and molten metal bleeds onto its moon boots. I slide clockwise around the garden, and find an astronaut bent over at the pineapple fountain, gargling water through its open visor. The astronaut raises its head to show me how its insides are full of water and juice boxes.
And then it explodes from one of the arsonist grenades. A cloud of colored drink cartons and steam roils into the air, curls around the chameleon's snout, which is clamped firmly around the arsonist's arm. She's still fighting, dropping explosives, one detonating underneath the chameleon's soft padded foot, tearing it in half up through the ankle in a dirty fan of blood and soil. Astronauts blow apart, shrapnel shredded. Two of them hug, completely on fire. The taper's midsection melts in a torrent of lava. With fire ringed around the whole node, I'm pushed deeper in, hacking through charred spacesuits. The arsonist unloads chambers of ammunition into the chameleon's volcano of eye, and pink gore sloshes from its cornea. The arsonist whips her entire bandolier into the torn gorge of eye muscle, and the reptile flings her hard into the foliage, spits her severed arm into the mud at my feet. The detonation is muted, like firecrackers popping inside the dirty coke bottle full of tadpoles, small frogs, and pond scum that's attached to my waist. Scales and skull fragments litter the air. A deluge of neon blood flushes away an astronaut pair in front of me. The chameleon's desperate now, launches its tongue hard into the garden, licking up sharp architecture, flaming space explorers, and exotic jungle wildlife. I duck under its rubber tunnel of extended gum and crawl to the node's center, beneath the stumbling draft, with astronauts clung to its back legs, one climbing, biting crescent chunks of meat out of its neck. If I don't find escape here, I'll end up worse than eaten. The arsonist is too far away. She's on her own. And if she's alive, she sure as fuck doesn't need me. I reach the taper, still eating fruit, despite having its entire stomach gouged out with flames. Its insides glow with golden heat, organs sputtering in sparkled flames around a man, a person, a person curled inside the stomach of a taper, nerves running from human spine to animal spine. <sighs> Shit, man. <laughs> I have to hope I'm right about this. Uh, I hack my sword into the taper's blunt forehead. <clears throat> and pry open a crack in its skull. The animal whinnies with its prehensile nose trunk slobbering all over my knees. But I don't think this is really a taper. I think it's the soldier this hellscape grew from. The one that's in the fetal position inside the animal's rib cage. And so I take a hemisphere of the creature's skull and pour a vial of chameleon saliva I've saved into its brain mass. Then I drink from the shattered bone, and lobes of brain organ inflate and unfold around me as a narrow, pink tunnel. And I crawl through to enter the memories and delusion of the soldier. Ha 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 ha!
<laughs> oh, how else? How else do you think I got this far? How else do you think I got this far? <laughs> how else do you think I got this far? <laughs> this far how else do you think i got this far